hey, I'm going to kind of start a series now, and it's going to be going through the Gospels, but going deeper into them, okay? Looking at them more from a Hebraic perspective. Um, let me see. Here's one of the, my little pictures. Uh, how many of you know the Bible says we need to search the Scriptures? Very important. And what we want to do is we're going to dig deeper. We're going to dig as deep as we can. We don't want to just touch the surface. We want to dig deep into the Word of God. So let's start with John 1, 1, verse, through verse 5. In the beginning was what? The Word. When you think of the Word, you think of something spoken or written. And the Word was with God. And the word was God. Wow. When you think of the word was God too, you think of God speaking a word. And when you think of in the beginning was the word, that almost could be in the beginning was the Torah. Some people believe the Torah came first before all the events. It's almost like you write a play and then people act it out. And some people think that the whole Torah was written first and then God put the play into motion and people were acting out what he already wrote. That's an interesting thought. And then it says, the same was in the beginning with God and all things were made by him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light. Wow, someone's life is the light. And what God, does God call us to do? He wants our life to be a light. But it also says the word is a hymn. Isn't that interesting? And now the word becomes personified. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I can't think, help but think of Genesis 1.1, it was all darkness. And then he brought light into that darkness. And that's just not physical darkness, that's moral darkness. And then look at Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And what was on the face of the earth? Darkness was on the face of the deep. And then it says, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now look at Isaiah 11 too. It talks about the Spirit of God moving on the waters. And here it says, the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Who's the him here? We have the Spirit, we have the Lord, and it says it's going to rest on him in Isaiah it says the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Well, what do you think Paul was talking about when he wrote the book of Colossians? Look at the seven spirits of God. It says, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, don't cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you would walk worthy of the Lord to all pleasing, and you're going to be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, and unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness, giving thanks to the Father, which has made us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And look at this, he delivered us from the power of darkness. Wow, what do you think that means? I mean, how does darkness without light, how does that have any power? You know, if you want power, you turn on the light switch and the darkness is gone. But how many of you know of moral darkness, that has a strong power over people that needs to be overcome. That's why it says he's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then it says, who is the image of the invisible God? So we have the invisible father whom no one can see and Yeshua becomes his image. 
And then it says, by him were, was everything created in heaven, in earth, visible, invisible, whether they're thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. And here it comes. All things were created by him and for him. He is before everything, and by him all things consist. So we see Yeshua existed long before any of creation. Now, in Hebrew, the word uh, bereshit, which means in the beginning, okay, reshit, if you get rid of the B and have reshit, reshit basically is the first, like the first fruits, but it, reshit is also a Hebrew name for the Messiah, because Messiah is the first fruits, right? So when you look at Rashid, meaning the Messiah, the letter bait can mean the word by or for. So the phrase in the beginning could also be translated as by the Messiah, for the Messiah, through the Messiah. And that's what this is talking about in Colossians. By him, he's saying Rashid, by him, for him, through him, everything happened that did happen. And then look at this, John 1, 10 and 11. He was in his own world. The world was even made by him and the world did not know him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. I can't help but think of uh, the song you guys were just, you know, singing. How so humbly he came. He's the one who created the world. I have their Brishit Barah Elohim. Hashemayim Be'et Haaretz with the et in the middle. He is the word of God. He created the earth, bringing it out of the water. He's holding it in his hands. And then he decided to come and visit his own creation. And his own creation didn't even recognize him. I, I can't help but think of uh, the next verse. Isaiah 1, 2, and 3. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Now, did God create the heavens and the earth? Okay. So he's talking to his own creation. And it says, the Lord has spoken... I've nursed and I brought up kids and they've rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doesn't know. My people don't even consider that I'm their creator. And so here he humbly, he comes to this earth, his own creation and his own creation doesn't recognize him. How many of you have ever owned a dog? Does the dog recognize you when you come home? And that's the point. Here God comes home and nobody even recognizes him. Why don't they recognize him? They haven't had a relationship with them. I mean, uh, what, what was it? I saw this one, you know, one of these stupid TV shows called Court TV or something. Or who's that famous judge, lady, Judge Judy? I don't know what it is. But anyway, it's one of those type of shows. And uh, these two ladies uh, claim the same, uh, they own the same dog, you know. And so it's my dog. No, it's my dog. Well, someone came in and dropped the dog down and the dog ran to the owner and the judge says, case closed. We know who it is. You know, well, I, I think it's fascinating that here God created us and he comes to us and we don't recognize him. And this reminds me again of Joseph, a type of the savior. Okay. His own brothers didn't recognize him. And why didn't they recognize him? He looked Egyptian. He was dressed like an Egyptian. And then the church says today, why don't the Jews recognize Jesus? Is because you're serving him an Egyptian Jesus. How can the Jews recognize the Jesus who's changed the language, who wants nothing to do with Torah? We've been, I mean, the Passover, he's got loaves of bread all over the table in the pictures, and it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the church wonders why the Jews don't recognize him. You're not presenting an authentic Jewish Yeshua. That's why. And look at Psalm 33, 6. You know, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. And here it says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. I mean, look how big this sun is. God breathes out stars. And look at this, in Proverbs 3, this is verse 19 and 20. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens, 
By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. Here we see three of the seven spirits of God, right? Or actually four of the seven spirits of God mentioned. This is a mind-blowing verse in Psalm 8, verse 22 and 23. The Lord possessed me. Who is me here? The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth even was. That I refers to wisdom, but that refers to the spirit of God and Messiah. And then John 1.14 is so incredible because it says the word was made flesh. Do you know what the Torah is made on? It's made on flesh. It's lambskin. And he was the lamb of God. And so here the Torah, the word of God was put into flesh. And then it says he dwelt among us. That means to tabernacle. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles is about because that is when Yeshua was born on the Feast of Tabernacles. And then it says, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of two things. What are they? And why is that? Well, if you remember back in Exodus, it says we beheld his glory, okay, full of grace and truth. In Exodus 33, 18, Moses says, show me your glory. Well, Exodus 34, 6, it says, the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, and here we go. Here's the gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. And so John 1, 14 got that from Exodus 34, 6. Now, here's a verse that is so often misinterpreted in every English Bible because English is so bad. It says in John 1, 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Guess what? The word but in every Bible is in italics because it wasn't in the Greek they decided to add that but, and therefore it sounds like, wow, Moses brought the law, but Yeshua brings grace and truth. No, grace and truth were mentioned in the law, okay? What it's saying is the Torah gave us Moses, and the Torah mentions the grace and the truth and the long suffering and abundance and goodness, and it says grace and truth came by Yeshua. Think of it this way. You love somebody, right? Would you rather send them an email or come and visit them? That's the difference. One came through the Torah where you can read it, but the other one came to give you a big hug. It's not that uh, the one is done away with, okay? It's just a matter of, wow, I got the love letter and I got my lover at the same time. Okay, look at Exodus 25 uh, or Exodus 40. Verse 34, it talked about a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. How many of you would like to see the glory of the Lord? You know, the glory of the Lord appeared three times in the Bible. Who can tell me what the three times were that the glory of the Lord appeared? Anyone can tell me all three? When you think you know all three, raise your hand. Go ahead, keep thinking. Anybody think they know the three times? Okay. I will tell you. The three regalim, the three feasts. Passover in Exodus. Pentecost in the book of Acts. And that Solomon's temple was dedicated at the Feast of Tabernacles. So the glory appears at the feast, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. And I'm hoping someday the glory appears again. Okay, let's go to uh, Exodus 25, 8 again. God said, let them make me a dwelling place. 
place that I can dwell among them. Did you know that's a wrong translation? It's supposed to be, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell within them. He wants to dwell within us. Now look at John 1, 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Now that word declared means to put him on exhibition. In other words, he, he was the image of the living God, which is why when the disciples said, show us the father, he says, basically, you're looking at him. I am the image of the father. Now, this is fascinating. In Revelation 1, 12 through 16, again, written by John, there's a voice speaking to him and he turns to see the voice and being turned, what did he see? Seven golden candlesticks. So here we go. I've got the seven golden candlesticks right there. And then it says, in the midst of the seven candlesticks was one likened to the son of man. He was clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with the golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun that shineth in his strength. Now, uh, here it says, right in the middle was this flame. You got all these flames here. What I, anyone know what I have there in Hebrew? Yeah, right in the middle is the all left top, but does anybody know what the rest of this says? Yes. Bereshit, bara Elohim, et Hashemayim, et Haaretz. In the beginning, created God, the heavens and the earth. How many words are there? There are seven words. And how many lamps in a menorah? Seven. And what's in the middle? One like unto the Son of Man, who is the Aleph Tav. Yeshua is the Aleph Tav. So John, who wrote, in the beginning was the Word. Here you have, in the beginning, when, you, when I say a dictionary from A to Z, I'm talking about every word in the dictionary. Well, here is the Word from Aleph to Tav which is like our A to Z. And the, what you could read this as is in the beginning created God, the Hebrew alphabet. Everything from A to Z, from Aleph to Tav, the word. And Yeshua is the word and he is the Aleph Tav. What I think is interesting is here in John, he's talking about this voice he heard in Revelation that had the sound of many waters. Any of you ever been to the ocean and hear the roar of the ocean? the waters. Well, look at, Revel, look at Ezekiel, I mean. In Ezekiel 43 verse 2, it's talking about the glory. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. So we see the glory tied to the sound of many waters as he speaks. Well, now let's go to Revelation 14 too. A voice from heaven comes to my ears like the sound of great waters, the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which came to me was like the sound of players playing on instruments of music. Can you imagine, worship team, a voice that sounds like all these instruments playing at one time? I can hardly wait to hear Yeshua sing. I mean, oh my gosh. I can't even carry a tune in a bucket. But I just think it's amazing. I, I had to read this a couple of times. His voice was like the sound of players playing on instruments, plural, of music. Think about that, worship team. A voice that sounds like an orchestra. Let's go to Revelation 1, 17 through 19. John sees him, and he 
fell on his face at his feet as a dead man. And then he lays his right hand on me and he says unto me, don't fear, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last. Now, how many first and last can there be? One first, one last. And this is again a verse that proves Yeshua is God and the Messiah. It says, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which you've seen and the things which are and the things which will be hereafter. So he had to write the past, the present, and things that are going to happen in the future. So let's go back to John 1, 19 through 22. It says, and this is the witness of John. That's John the Baptist or John the Mercer. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to him with one big question, they go to John the Baptist and they say, who are you? Now, I think they already knew he was John the Baptist. When they said, who are you? In other words, who do you think you are? And John the Baptist said quite openly and straightforwardly, I'm not the Messiah. And they said to him, well, if you're not the Messiah, what are you? Are you Elijah? And he said, nope. Then they said, are you the prophet? And he says, nope. When they say, are you the prophet, what are they referring to? I heard someone back there say it. Let's take a look. Uh, Then he says, I'm not. And then they said to him, well, who are you? We have to give some answer to those who sent us. What do you to say about yourself? Well, the reason why they said Elijah and the prophet, if you look at Malachi 4, 5, the Lord says, I'm sending you Elijah the prophet before the day of the Lord comes. That great day greatly to be feared. All right. So they were wondering if he was Elijah based on this verse. But he wasn't necessarily Elijah because he wasn't coming on the great day to be feared. He was coming on the great day of his coming, first coming. Well, then look at Deuteronomy 18, 18 and 19. God says, I will give them a prophet without a name from among themselves like you. I'll put my words in his mouth and he will say to them, whatever I give him orders to say and whoever doesn't give ear to my words, which he will say in my name will be responsible to me. That's why they ask, are you Elijah? Then they ask, are you the prophet referring to this? And he says, nope, I'm none of those. And then look what happens in John 1, 29 and verse 30. This is another powerful verse showing Yeshua's divinity. The day after, John sees Jesus coming to him and he says, see, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, let me ask you something. Who was born first, John the Baptist or Jesus? John the Baptist was born first. Okay, and look what this says. This is he of whom I said, one is coming after me who was put over me because he was in existence before me. Hello, right there he's telling you, I was born before him and he comes after me, but he exists before me. And then look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 2 through 6. Now, when John had news in prison of the works of the Messiah. So here's John the Baptist. He's in prison and he's hearing the works that Jesus does. Remember, they're like first cousins. He sent his disciples to say to him, are you the one who's coming or are we waiting for another? Now, have you ever wondered about that? You ever wondered, how can John the Baptist, after he made all this testimony about he's the one, and then he says, so tell me, are you the one or is there another? Does anyone know why he asked? Many people think it's because he lacked faith. Totally wrong. He didn't lack any faith. The Jews have always believed in two messiahs. One, a suffering servant. One, a conquering king. And John the Baptist in jail says, are you the conquering king or or are you the suffering servant? You know, if you're the suffering servant, then the conquering king has yet to come. 
So he knew he was the Messiah, but he didn't know which Messiah. He didn't realize that Yeshua is both and there's two comings. See, the Jews believe in one coming and two Messiahs. We believe in two comings and one Messiah. So what John, he doesn't have a lack of faith. He's about to get his head chopped off. (laughs) And he says, are you the one that's going to get me out of here? (laughs) Basically. All right, so when he, he's not doubting that he's the Messiah. He's just questioning because he thinks there's going to be two Messiahs. They can't imagine how a Messiah could come. They read Isaiah 53 and all these other ones. There's the suffering servant who dies, but then they also read in Daniel, well, there's one who's coming on the clouds with all the power of the Messiah. And so that's why they always thought there were two Messiahs. Okay, they didn't see two comings. They see two different Messiah. One dies and the other is the conquering king. But that's why he said that, so you know. It's not because he was lacking faith. Oh, and then he goes and he says, now, um, he says, who is to come or waiting for another? And how does Jesus answer? He said, okay, go and give news to John of the things which you are seeing and hearing. The blind are seeing. Those who were not able to are now walking. Lepers are made clean. Those who were without hearing now have their ears. Oh, no. Whoever gave me these notes didn't give me the last page. Let me see your notes for a second here. <clears throat> okay. There we are over here. And well, it end with Matthew 11, 2 through 6. Okay. Um, the dead come to life again and the poor have the good news given to them and a blessing will be on him who has no doubts about me. Uh, So I I really believe that he's saying, especially when it comes to the healing of the lepers, no leper had ever been cleansed in Israel. None. And so now the lepers are being cleansed. And one of the names of the Messiah was going to be the leper Messiah because he was the one that was going to heal the leper. So he knows he's the Messiah. And now look at John 1, 33 and 34. It says, I had no knowledge who he was, but he who sent me to give baptism with water said to me, the one on whom you see the spirit coming down and resting, it is he who gives the baptism with the Holy Spirit. This I saw myself and witnessed that he is the son of who? Okay, John the Immerser knew, uh, well, and the apostle John knew that he was the son of God. But look at Proverbs chapter 30, verse four. And it's a question, and it's supposed to be meant as a quiz. Who ascended up into heaven or descended? Who gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who established all the ends of the earth? And then it says, what is his name and what is his son's name, if you can tell? So here we see there's a God and there's a son of God. As a matter of fact, in Psalms 2, verse 12, it says, you better kiss the son, lest he becomes angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So here we see there is a son of God. But look at Daniel. This is chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Daniel in a season, a night vision, and behold, one like the son of who? Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. And look at this. Was given, what was given to him but dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which won't pass away. And his kingdom, one that will never be destroyed. So here we see someone coming with the clouds of heaven, but it's the son of man who's coming with the clouds of heaven. Now look at Psalm 89, 18, when it talks about the yud heh vav they say our breastplate is the Lord and our king is the Holy One of Israel. So the Lord is the king of Israel and he is the Holy One of Israel. But now 
This is incredible. This is John 1, 49 through 51. We see both titles in these verses. Nathaniel says to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are king of Israel. Here it just got that saying that Yahweh is the king of Israel. And now in John 1, he's saying to Yeshua, you are the king of Israel. You are the son of God. And look how Jesus answers. You have faith because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. You're going to see greater things than this. And he said to him, truly, I say to every one of you, you will see heaven opening and God's angels going up and coming down upon the son of man. So here he's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's, he's both in one. And so that's what he's truly God and he's truly man. And this is what is amazing to me. Again, can you imagine how many of you, and this is really absurd question, but you created dogs. Would you become a dog to help save the dogs? I mean, think of God himself, the king of the universe who created everything, humbles himself so low just to become like his children. I mean, the song you guys sing, he humbled himself. I mean, can you th- if anyone's going to be full of pride, it would be God. And that reminds me of another verse, Micah 6, 6 through 8. It says, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. To do what? Do justly and actually love being merciful. Sometimes when we're merciful, we don't love it. But we have to do it. He loves being merciful. And then it says, and walk humbly, not in front of your God, walk humbly with your God. We serve a humble God. How horrible for a God who so humbles himself to come among us, and then a proud man walks before him like he's just something else. How, what absurdity. And for me, the greatest thing I think that would drive anyone to the Lord is God's humility and his mercy, and his love. If that doesn't drive you to run toward him, I think people run away from him because they don't know him. They don't know him. But that's because the church has been presenting God like Thor, who throws lightning bolts at the people down below. If you think you're gonna get people to heaven by preaching hellfire and brimstone, never, 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 never. You show a God who is loving and merciful, and they'll come a running. But with that, let's stand.